We are live, and we're talking about the the history and the development of these so-called Amazonian liturgies. All of us, for the first time on social media or YouTube, saw in the Vatican Gardens, Pope Francis uh, seated at, presiding at, overseeing, I don't know what the word is, but there was a, a female, I don't know the term, shaman, who uh, oversaw some some rituals, some rites. People were holding hands, shaking rattles, giving the Pope a black ring. And uh, today with me is the eminent Michael Hitchborn, president and leader of the Lepanto Institute. And we're going to talk about the origin of these liturgies and how they relate to socialism. And also uh, this curious goddess, idol, Pachamama. Is that right? Michael? Pachamama, Pachamama. I, I've heard pronouncements on both sides. Pacha, I've also seen Mama Pacha or Mama oh, Paca. Interesting. Got to flip it around. But before we do all that, we're going to ask our Heavenly Father to bless us, prepare us, forgive us of our sins, and get us ready to go. So we're going to do that by praying the Our Father in Latin, the Pater Noster. In nomine Patris, et Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui est in Celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum. Adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. So, Hitchborn, what do you think, yes, man? Sir. Paganism, so, paganism oh, at the Vatican, idolatry. It really, it's it's paganism and it's idolatry. You know, it's it's uh, both wrapped up into the same thing. Um, I don't know if you remember, uh, but a couple of, or, or about a week or so ago, George Newmayer put a uh, photo up on his Facebook feed where it, it showed you know this. Well, it's called a mandala, the uh, the round cloth that was put on the ground. And then they've got this pregnant naked uh, statue that they referred to as Our Lady of the Amazon, which is not Our Lady of the Amazon. Uh, they have this. Not canoe. my mama. Not my mama. That's right. Are you my mama? Um, that's not my mama. They have, no. they have these uh, this canoe with a couple of paddles in there and then all these little different uh, trinkets laid around on this on this. Um, white cloth and then behind it it, uh, in this display is an image of two people or or there are two different images one is uh, a nun who was murdered i think in 2006 her name was dorothy stang uh stang being kind of an interesting name um and the other being yeah i went there (laughs) the other being shiko shikuru uh shiko shikuru was a um, he was a, ch- a chief of the Shikuru tribe in the Amazon. Uh, he became the chief of the Amazonian tribe in 1985. Now, what's interesting about this guy? So you have these two images there in this display, and from what I understand, uh, the idea is that in Rome they are trying to elevate these two to some sort of martyrdom status. They're trying to Mm. make as if these individuals are martyrs. And uh, so they're being promoted and elevated and paraded around throughout Rome. Uh, So I started doing a little bit of digging into Shiko Shukuru. Um, And what what I'm starting to see is that everything about what's happening in the Roman Synod really does come back to this guy. He, he's a, a very interesting character in the whole development of this, this synod. Um, he, he was killed in 1998. Uh, so he was assassinated. Um, he was the chief of this tribe, but he was also a, a, he was a, an agitator. He would go in and, and uh, conduct these, these um, uh, you know, the, the marches and and uh, protests and rallies and things like that and and he actually created quite a bit of strife between the local people the the so-called indigenous peoples there and local landowners now why do you suppose that there would be any strife with a landowner has nothing to do with 
oppression or slavery or any of those kinds of things. But the, the moniker of landowner really does tie back to his ties with the Socialist Party of Brazil. So anyway, I was looking into this guy. Uh, his real name is Francisco de Assisi Araujo. Um, and sounds Catholic. It sounds very Catholic. In fact, he was a Catholic, uh, <laughs> so to speak. Um, I got him I, up on the screen. You can't see him, Michael, but everybody can see it's Shikuru, right? That's how you say his last name. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. actually not his last name. That's the name of the tribe. Okay. That's so right. Shiko is his name, his, his Indian name, um, as chief of the tribe and Shikuru is a reference to the name of the tribe. Yeah. He's got his uh, yellow polo shirt on with his headdress. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I, I've seen several different pictures of him, but he's got this headdress, the feather yeah. headdress. And Now, what's interesting is that he became the chief in 1985. Uh, as he was the chief, he started working with the local shaman, the, the, the tribal shaman and the tribal elders. And the idea was that they were going to start bringing back the ancient rituals. And he talks about in his, because I, I had a video uh, that was a documentary about him, about a half an hour video. And in this interview with him, he starts talking about how um, as, as the chief, he was working with them on trying to bring about these ancient rites and rituals. And by 1988, they performed for the first time in hundreds of years what was called the rock ceremony. Uh, this the rock. was a the rock ceremony, and it was it was a uh, an earth worship, uh, mother nature pantheistic uh, ritual where they I, I don't actually know what the ceremony was. He, he didn't describe it, but in his uh, work with these tribesmen, he then started talking about how they had been oppressed by the white man and that uh, it was because of this oppression that he decided that he needed to re-identify his people by going back to the ancient rituals. So what he's talking about ultimately is bringing back paganism, pagan ritualism, and incorporating it into the native peoples while pointing at the white man and saying that they are the reason for oppression and suppression, etc. It, it was illegal in Brazil, by the way, uh, until 1988 when, the, when they performed the rock ceremony to practice these ancient pagan rituals mm -hmm. because it's a Catholic country. Right. And so this Catholic, uh, Francisco de Assisi Arojo, uh, became the chief and started – reproducing these ancient pagan rituals and they call it the it was enculturated christianity sound interesting or sound uh, familiar yeah. so this enculturated christianity this idea that they were going to reintegrate these these identities as as indigenous peoples uh is in indeed what they are talking about in rome right now so when you see how he's talking about we're connected with the rocks and we're connected with the waters and we're connected with the mountains and the fields and the forest and blah, blah, blah. All of that, <laughs> slow clap, yes. All of that really does come back to this, this syncretism that is being paraded in Rome now. And that's, that's exactly what it is. It's syncretism. So in this video, and, and that's all within the first three minutes of the video of, of this half hour long presentation on Shiko Shikuru at three minutes and 30 seconds in the interview, he talks about how they had to hide their rituals, uh, before they were allowed to have their, uh, their big right in 1988. So he was actually working in secret to bring back these pagan rites and to start venerating their demon gods and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of course, you know, they don't say, oh, they're demonic or anything like that. No, no, no. Uh, the, these people are very connected with nature and they, they have a very strong uh, respect for nature. And, th and that's the way they couch it. What's very interesting. Oh, I mean, there's so many interesting things about this. But another very interesting element here is that in this approach to naturalism, which is what it is, uh, this naturalistic approach to uh, elevating nature and, and having this connected connection with Mother Earth, 
Shyanka Shukuru spoke very uh, highly and 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 stressed the importance of uh, an ecological approach and how we have to we have to be more connected with the earth because the white man in oppressing us is also um, uh, raping the earth, so to speak. Uh, they're they're stripping the land of the resources and they're polluting the earth and we have to have a more ecological approach, which again is exactly what they're talking about in Rome. They're using this naturalism, this veneration of the earth as a means of promoting their environmental, well, it's earth worship. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and they're, they're pushing it in a, in a very, in the same way that the socialists use it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyway, um, At five minutes, so at five minutes into this uh, interview. Now, what's the name of the interview again? Because people might want to go check it out. Yeah, so the interview, it's just Shako Shukuru. If you look it up on YouTube, um, it's X-I-C-A-O-X-U-K-U-R-U. So you can Good. you can watch this half-hour video. It's, uh, it's very enlightening, but you have to look at it through the lens of what's taking place in Rome right now in order to really grasp what's what's happening uh so if you if you pay attention to what's going on in rome you look at that pachamama statue that uh mm-hmm. we've seen laying out in rome mm-hmm. and that was i mean they bowed down and, and venerated this thing in the vatican gardens it's it's still in front of the all i found i asked someone yesterday it's still in front of the altar at santa maria and traspatina somebody i beg you go get rid of it burn it Burn it. It is an I get. It is a pagan idol. There is nothing Catholic or even Christian about these statues. I mean, for crying out loud, in the Vatican Gardens, uh, who was it? Um, uh, Austin Ivory tried claiming that this statue represented the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, and then somebody else said that well, you have one big statue and one little statue, and it represents the Blessed Virgin Mary and Saint Elizabeth, and so the two of them together yeah. represent presented the um, uh, the visitation, which is absurd. It is right. absolutely absurd. The, the pagan roots of these two statues have to do with the myths of the indigenous peoples of the area. One of them represents the pregnant moon goddess, and the other represents the pregnant earth goddess. And they wind up generating um, the, the universe through self-copulation. Mm. Dang. If you, if, yeah, if you read into, there. yes, they did. Uh, and this, of course, it's a perversion of, uh, yeah, a- absolutely. Yeah. Thumbs down. But it's, it's a perversion of the virgin birth because it absolutely is. There are that these, these, uh, idols, these pagan goddesses were able to produce the universe through their own, uh, virginal conceptions. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of, I've been talking to a lot of people, priests, about this, and one of the concerns that we have is is that it seems that the Pope has named this image Our Lady of Amazon. And so, as a Catholic, I want to be careful, because I, I know that there are indigenous versions of Our Lady that don't look like Our Lady of Fatima. So I, you know, I want to be careful about that. And I think all Catholics want to be careful. Of course, none of us want to be accused of being racist, God forbid. But you know, it does. It does not seem at all. You know, this idol, this image. She's not wearing a veil. She's naked. Her uterus is colored in red. Right. I don't know what is that. What that is. You know, it looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's colored in red. She's on her knees, like about to give birth. Uh, there's face paint honor uh and like you said there's a there's two of them in in the vatican gardens you know interesting too uh michael is pope leo the 13th he wrote the saint michael prayer yes he also wrote the exorcism prayer the saint michael exorcism prayer and it is said he had it written in a small book and every single day he would walk the vatican gardens and pray the saint michael exorcism prayer no kidding that's in the vatican gardens now we have francis bringing in a shaman, spreading out a blanket, bringing in idols, mm-hmm. shaking rattles. It should rattle us. 
Well, not only that, but um, you you actually reminded me of something uh, with Pope Leo the Thirteenth saying the uh, the exorcism prayers in the Vatican Gardens. Uh, I mean, we can juxtapose that with this uh, <laughs> tree planting ceremony that they had. But I was uh, you reminded me that I think it was in 1936, if I recall correctly, Pope Pius the was it the 12th or the 11th? One of the two Piuses. I can't remember. I can never remember when one died and the other one came right. in. Just say Pope Pius and roll with it. The, the, there we go. <laughs> so Pope Pius, uh, in, um, in, in, at some point, he actually witnessed the miracle of the sun in That's the, the 12th. Vatican. Pius the 12th. 12th. Yes. In so, the garden. Yes, in the garden. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, why would the Pope see the miracle of the sun in the garden? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Father, Father Wolf, I believe, um, who did a a marvelous 13 part series on Our Lady of Revelation. Yes, he did. uh, He he talked about this vision of or or the uh, the the manifestation of the miracle of the sun to Pope Pius XII. And he used it as a means as a sign that that God was using in order to. Uh, say that there is something that is about to happen. There's something uh, extremely significant that's going to happen. And he used it to talk about revelation and talk about, you know, showing various prophecies that all kind of come together and and the uh, that the miracle of the sun is not just some uh, other miraculous event, but is actually a, a miraculous warning of biblical proportions. Because the sun miracles specifically uh, portent uh, certain cataclysmic events. And for this to happen in the Vatican Gardens and for it to be seen by the Pope, by the Pope, uh, I think is significant. And and I didn't make the connection until you mentioned Leo XIII. And I think that now we can look back and say, oh, I wonder if that event was – a pre- preparation and a, and a forewarning of some horrible thing that was going to take place in the Vatican gardens, right. which is he did two weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, we have Leo the 13th praying daily, the exorcism prayer in the Vatican gardens. And then you, again, you have Pius the 12th who has his own apparition of the sun dancing in the Vatican gardens. We right. also have the biblical significance of a garden. Right. And yes. the Pope is the Supreme pontiff. Right, he's mm-hmm. the vicar of Christ. Is the new Adam? Saint Paul says, the Pope is the vicar of Christ. He's the steward standing in for the new Adam, you know, right. the new Adam of the new creation. And here he is sitting by idly, while a woman, <laughs> shaman, mm-hmm. dances with the devil. I don't like this. Well, and what else is significant about this is that it was a tree planting ceremony. Boom. So what kind of tree are we talking about? You know, the fall in the garden was Mm -hmm. revolving around a tree. And then we look at the the beginning of our Lord's passion, which began in a garden. And we can see that maybe this is significant because the church's passion also was, is now taking place in in a garden. garden. That's right. Yeah. It's, this is, this is epic folks. I'm not trying to be sensationalist. I'm just, we are called to be biblical people, students of the Bible. We're called to interpret, you know, the way reality through this lens and, you know, to see, I can't think of any time in 2000 years in which a Pope engaged in idolatry. There is the case of Pope Marcellinus. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's, you know, just before Constantine. And there is a legend that he offered incense to the gods. Right. St. Augustine of Hippo says it's not true. It never happened, but it was already in circulation by 300s, you sure. know, early 400s. Um, that's the only thing we have close to, but this is outright. I mean, this is an idol in the Vatican Gardens. And now, right now, while we're talking in front of the altar at Santa Maria Traspatina, there's another picture of them bringing the, the idol in a boat Oh into God. St. Peter's, mm-hmm. into St. Peter's. Yeah. That happened. Yeah, well, there was another uh, video also of them processing one of these canoes while one of these women, 
uh, these native women was sitting in the canoe and she's sitting there. She's rowing. Along. She's rowing. And then behind her is an entourage of other native people pretend rowing as they're walking up the aisle. And what's it? It's you like know, a dumb youth group thing, man. It really is. And, and somebody, so somebody posted the video and I said, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that this isn't a part of any indigenous right anywhere ever. <laughs> you know? right. What does that have to do with anything? It's all pageantry. Yes. It's all pageantry. And, and the pageantry has a point though, because when you start looking at the, uh, the push for an indigenous right, mm-hmm. which is where all this is going a new okay? liturgy, they're looking at a new liturgy. They're looking at a, a pan Amazonian liturgy. Yeah. It's going to be the uh, novus novus ordo double right. novus. And, and that's the thing. That's, that's the ultimate aim of all of this. Uh, and they want to incorporate, uh, the shaman practices, the, the local, uh, enculturated Christianity is what they call it. Mm-hmm. Now let's, let's go back to the example of Shiko Shikuru for a second. Because Before we do, Michael, real quick, I found the picture. You're not going to see it on your end, but I'm going to throw it up on the screen. This is, let me blow it up for people. This is the, this is Pope Francis. They're in St. Peter's, people. You can see the boat. Mm-hmm. The reason you know this is St. Peter's is you can see the Baldacchino over the altar of the Pope, St. Peter, which is over the tomb of Peter. Behind the Pope, you can see in the distance the altar of the chair of Peter. You actually see it in the picture. The chair of Peter, just above that's the stained glass, which has the Holy Spirit in it. And you can see the Pope flanked by two cardinals and a bishop. They have a a bulletin out, and they're doing something, saying something. But you can see the canoe. You can see a hat, a basket, a rattle, an oar, and, uh, of course, the Mama, Mama Pacha. Or Paca Mama, we're not quite sure. But it, you can the, see yeah. it all right here. This is in St. Peter's. They are they are standing. Just for those of you who've never been to Rome, they are standing about thirty meters from the tomb of St. Peter. Is the uh, is the rainbow net there also in the picture? Rainbow net is not here. That's back at Santa yeah. Maria Traspatina. But they brought it here. They're processing it around. What's sad is, you know, what I was thinking, Michael. All the money, all the effort, three weeks, flying in bishops, flying in Amazonians, all this work. What if they took the same amount of effort and the same amount of money and they brought in bishops and consecrated Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, like like she asked? And Boom. processed around Fatima, Our Lady of Fatima, instead of a boat with uh, Pachamama on it. Right. Uh, my wife actually made the point that, uh, you know, all these bishops and cardinals and the pope are sitting nice and comfortably in their um, in their homes there in Rome yep. uh, as they bring just a few of these local Amazonians, you know, their, their concern for the poor and all that, uh, when the same expense could have been spent sending all of them to the discomfort of the local areas in the Amazon right. where they would be, you know, bombarded by the giant horse flies and, and the, uh, the mosquitoes, mosquitoes. And, humidity and everything else. And, and, and imagine all of the money that they would have brought with them that would have boosted the local economy uh, because of their efforts there in the Amazon. But, you know, through their uh, concern for the poor, they'd much rather stay home. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, it, the hypocrisy here is staggering when you think about it in terms of even how they approach putting this whole thing together. I know. When I told people I was going last weekend to Rome for the uh, you know, Amazonian Synod, they're like, why are you going to Rome? I thought it was in the Amazon. I was like, no, no, the, the bishops aren't going to go to Amazon. They're going to go to Rome and have an right. Amazon Synod in Rome. Right. And, and that's also kind of an unusual thing. Most synods take place in the area where they're discussing uh, the <laughs> yeah. problem that they're trying to fix. Uh, and of course, you know, they're not even discussing the real problem here, which is a lack of evangelization and a right. lack of proper catechesis. They want to try and figure out a way to merge Christianity with paganism. Right. And I, I have I can't stress that enough. This is syncretism. They are pushing a syncretic uh, or, or a syncretistic approach to two different incompatible faiths. Yeah. And and. So I was I was about to go back to uh, Shiko Shikuru because this this idea of a merged uh, Christianity and, and paganism, I, I want to 
give this example through Shiko Shikuru because at five minutes into the interview that he gave, this is a quote from him. For us, the earth is our mother. If she is our mother who gives us everything we need, then she must be cared for and preserved. Now, there's a lot wrapped up and packaged in this one little statement. For one thing, as a Catholic, to say that the earth is the mother is, it, it's blasphemy. Yeah. Because the church is our mother and our lady is our mother, not the earth. The earth is, a, is, is an object, um, but our lady and the church are persons. So to say that the earth is our mother is, is false and it's blasphemy. Um, it's he, pagan. He, Pagans it, talk like that. It, yes, yes. Uh, he also says, and if she is our mother who gives us everything, no, no, the church gives us everything. Our lady gives us everything. The earth is the vehicle by which God provides for us. It is not a thing. It is not a person. Um, and then he ends with, then she must be cared for and preserved. So this idea of caring for and preserving the earth, proper stewardship, yes, there is proper stewardship. But the opposite end of that is actually saying that we have to cultivate the earth as if it is something to be venerated and, and worshipped. Yeah, to use the language of philosophy, they're saying that the earth is personal. It's a person. Right. Right. And that's, that is a, there's a it, fourth it, hypostasis here. Yeah. And that yeah. is earth. And they're talking about, you know, the voice of the earth Listen, We have heard right. the voice of the earth. I've never heard the voice of the earth. Oh, yeah. Earth doesn't <laughs> talk. <laughs> <laughs> the earth is inanimate, which means not with a soul. It's not personal. It's not alive. The earth is not alive. Right. And then, of course, you go back to the Psalms where da King David actually specifically says, why, pl why pray to the idols made of wood, which cannot speak? Right. I mean, well, OK. Of course, King David also said that all the gods of the pagans are devils, yes. which, uh, you know, all the apologists want to say, oh, no, that's not what he he didn't mean that they were all demons. I mean, they, <laughs> he just meant that worshiping the material was some sort of demonic right. thing. It was against the, the faith <laughs> yeah. as if. Yeah. Um, so with Chikau, is it Chikau Chikuru? Is that how you say his name? Chikau? Chikau, yeah. Chikau. So Chikau is, he's saying that we're recovering these pagan or spiritual rites, rituals that haven't been celebrated in hundreds of years because of Catholic colonialism. Mm -hmm. What are the chances that these are just completely made up? I mean, I'm looking at this picture and I'm seeing they got a blanket laid out, but this blanket has been screen printed. No one yep. painted this with pigments of the jungle. <laughs> this was obviously made at a local t-shirt shop. Uh -huh. You know, uh, even people have pointed out that the the face paint that they're wearing, even in the jungle, is Halloween makeup paint. Like these pigments and colors don't appear in the jungle. They've gone to a store, they've purchased the paints, and then they so it's not something original or indigenous to their their culture. That this cult seems to be right. made, it might have Ancient, obviously, Pachamama is a real ancient. Actually, you know what? I was doing a little research last night. I actually had come across Pachamama in my viewing of cinematography, as have you, Michael. There is, in a great film called Indiana Jones mm. and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, do you remember at the beginning when he goes into that temple and there's a golden uh, yep. idol and he measures the sand and he does the little switcheroo? That's Pachamama. Yes, it is. Did you know that's that? Right. I, I do. Yeah, I did. That's Pachamama. Yeah, yeah that's right. I, I'd forgotten, but yes, you're absolutely right. That is Pachamama. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's funny. You're talking about the uh, the face paint and everything else. Do you remember, I guess it was last week, Pope Francis got up and he scolded the Western world for making fun mm -hmm. of the indigenous people mm -hmm. who brought up the uh, the gifts with the feathered headdress. Yeah. Um, of course, he's the one who who scolded the world and and made fun of priests who wear saturnos and cassocks. Correct. Uh, but you know that's okay. But you can't say anything about funny feathered headdresses. 
Um, what's interesting about his scolding of the world over that particular instant, the guy who brought up the, the gifts and, and he's, he's, you can see him in many different pictures all throughout this whole synodal process. Um, he was part of the ceremony that took place in the Vatican gardens. He was the one who brought up the gifts. He was present for uh, the big procession from St. Peter's to, um, to the, uh, the synod when it opened. Uh, the same guy after mass after in the same mass where he brought up the gifts after mass, he and his indigenous peoples unfurled a vinyl sign <laughs> and on the sign, it said something about having to have respect and, and reverence for mother nature yeah, yeah. or mother yeah. earth. Yes. Yeah, I think it, in part of it, I saw a nun holding it too. It was listen to mother, listen to the voice of mother earth or something right. like that. Yeah. And, and and so you, you look at it and you go, where did the vinyl sign come from? Right. Was that something that they painted in the jungle too? I, I guess vinyl comes from a plant, maybe? Yeah. It uh, does. Oh, actually it, it comes from petroleum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so it's it's something that's mined out of the earth. So they're using the same materials to promote their their uh, their heterodoxy um and actually their syncretism, their heresy. In in a in a in a hypocritical way, and it's it, it's just it blows the mind to see just how I, I don't know I don't even have words for it. No, it, I mean I've 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 studied all these pictures carefully. The and you know I understand I wouldn't want to live with no clothes on in a jungle with mosquitoes and gnats and my infants getting infections and lack of food and all the I wouldn't want any of that right. And one of the great benefits is, you know, we always say, well, Western this and Western that. Baloney. It's Christian. It's Catholic. Right. Who started the universities and the hospitals and all this? The Catholics. So, what, yes, Catholics brought colonization, but they also brought all of these gifts over time, right? And so, yes, you see pictures. They have a Timex on because they want to mm -hmm. know what time it is, right? Uh, they're wearing, like, Chikao Chikuru on the screen right now. He's wearing a polo. That's yeah. a lot. I like wearing polos. I don't want to wear woven yucca plants. I want to wear nice cotton, you know, grown in Southern United States, woven together. It feels good. You know, it's breathable. I like it. It's wonderful. But what they're doing is, is they're saying these evil Westerners, these evil Catholics, you know, that brought so much punishment to our place. We well, yeah, they're wearing a digital watch. And there's even show that so many of these people live in the city. And then they'll go out to perform in front of the cameras and then go back to the city. And a yep. lot of it has to do with um, subsidi subsidies and checks and all that, right? Uh, <laughs> if they uh. live on the land, they get more money or they get support. So it seems that there's, there's, there's hypocrisy in this. They want to go back to the old ways, mm. but yet they don't. Well, it's, it's hypocrisy, but it's also syncretism in practice when you think about it. Because... It's not like they want to go back into the jungle and, and practice their, their old cannibalistic ways. Uh, they want to have the creature comforts of the Western world, but they also want to have the pagan rituals as well. Right. So it's, it's in practice the syncretistic approach to what they're trying to implement in Rome uh, in, in the liturgy. Right. So in, in, um, in the real world sense, they want their comfortable clothes. They want their cotton shirts. Uh, you see them processing up and down the aisles wearing gym pants, which certainly doesn't seem like native dress wear to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, they're wearing their gym pants with their, their traditional feather headdresses. Headdress. So it's, that is syncretism in a practical sense. And so in, in a philosophical sense, they are then – or, or a theological sense, they are then also trying to uh, create that syncretistic approach with the uh, the liturgy by saying we can have our earth worship nature uh, ritual that goes along with the Eucharistic procession. Um, so just to wrap up Shiko Shikuru here for a second, at the very end of this whole video, uh, and this I think is kind of the culmination of it, of it all, uh, he was assassinated in May of 1998, uh, and of course, everybody was crying, and they had this procession, and you can see in the video, they are carrying, they're processing his body in a, a casket, and on top of the casket is a crucifix, 
So mm. again, signifying his original name, St. Francis de, uh, de Assisi. Right. But then the prayer that is being prayed as they process is this. Receive your son, my mother nature. He won't be buried. He will be planted so that from new warriors will be born my mother nature. He will be planted, my mother nature, the way he wanted under your shadow, my mother nature. To give life to new warriors, my mother nature, so that our fight won't stop, my mother nature. Right. Not one mention of Christ. Mm -hmm. It is all about uh, the worship of mother nature. And when you take the imagery of the crucifix on the casket, I mean, the the... The symbolism here is incredibly rich when you start diving into it. The, the crucifix on the casket, the death of Christianity, and imposed over it is a prayer that is impossible, a prayer to Mother Nature, mm -hmm. a prayer to a dead object. Mm -hmm. And so Shiko Shukuru, in his life, embodied this syncretism between paganism and Christianity, where paganism is being superimposed on the structure of Christianity. And that is precisely what is what they are trying to do with the liturgy in Rome right now, is superimpose a pagan prayer on the structure of a dead church. Correct. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the picture, if the Amazonian religion is good in itself. It should stand on itself, but that's not enough. They must bring in Pachamama into St. Peter's. They must take up space. And one of the commentators on this channel uh, wrote me and had a really good thought. And I wanted to share it with everyone. She said she had been formerly a, a, a Wiccan or a pagan. And this was a comment on the drag queens who read in the libraries, which we've all seen. And she said, what you don't understand is Pagans understand, just like ancient Catholics used to understand, that you win by taking up and occupying space. Right? It used to be that priests would march with their people with the sacrament or statues of our saints around the parish boundary. They were saying to the spiritual world and to the physical world, this belongs to us through Christ. Yeah. What we don't understand as modern Catholics or what we should understand is when a drag queen goes to the library, what they're saying is this is a public place funded by your tax money and we are occupying it. And we are occupying it with your children, right? So it, it's a demonic occupation. So what we need to do is, and remember at Vatican II, after Vatican II, Eucharistic processions, poof. Right. Marian processions, Poof. Ask a modern Catholic, have you ever been on a on a Marian procession or a Eucharistic pr procession? I went twice in Rome to Corpus Christi in 95, uh, 2015, 2016 Corpus Christi. There was a procession. The Pope both times didn't do it. That was Francis. And then after that, he just went ahead and he, he uh, got rid of the Corpus Christi Eucharistic procession altogether. It's gone. So the idea of taking the sacred into the public and processing it, the pagans are doing it. We're not doing it. They're taking their image into the heart of St. Peter, 30 meters from the bones of St. Peter, and they're taking up space. And for them, this, this signifies in a demonic sacramental sense a victory. Yeah. Taking ground. They're taking the high ground, literally. Vatican Hill, you know, the high ground. It's interesting. Uh, I was reading this morning. I, I was uh, because today's Columbus Day, which uh, is is incredibly ironic. You know, you you look through the procession or, or the progression of the way this whole synod has kind of unfolded. Uh, you see the symbolism and the 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 parallels uh, all throughout the culture. Now, what we have going on with the uh, the the problems associated with uh, Columbus Day, everybody wants to tear down Columbus. They want to say that Christo Christopher Columbus was this terrible person and he was the, the reason for the, the horrible things that happened to the indigenous peoples and, and the Indians. And gosh, they just would have been better off had they had white man never landed and Christopher Columbus is to blame for that. 
Except that Christopher Columbus's primary purpose in interacting with the indigenous peoples, the, the Indians there, was their conversion because he saw this as an opportunity to not only expand the membership of the church, but to save souls. And in so doing, uh, by a provident, a work of providence, he did this on the eve of the most horrific rebellion within Christianity. It was just before the Protestant revolt in Germany, just before the English uh, decided that they were going to throw off the yoke of Rome. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in so it was the Spanish who settled uh, in South America, converted the Indians through a lady of Guadalupe uh, by the millions. And so just as Christians were apostatizing and falling into heresy in Europe, they were growing and thriving in South America. And there are so many South American saints now as a result. And, and one of the things my wife and I were talking about, because we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. My wife, too, with every conversation. <laughs> every single one. <Yeah. laughs> uh, you know, everybody talks, you know, so the, the, the naysayers say, well, Christopher Columbus brought all these diseases to the indigenous peoples. And, and uh, first of all, they try to claim that it was some sort of germ warfare, which is ridiculous, uh, <laughs> considering they, they didn't discover germs until the 1800s. But the, um, the, the sicknesses that the, peop the Indians caught because they didn't realize that the Europeans had developed an immune system that the people of, of the Americas had not developed. So they did get sick and a lot of them died. It wasn't intentional. It was accidental, but we have to remember St. Kateri Takakwitha. Mm -hmm. She suffered smallpox and she almost died. Yes, that's right. And we can say if white man never came, she would never have contracted smallpox and her parents would have lived. However, if, uh, the white man had never come, then St. Kateri would also not be a saint. And I think that she would be the first to say, I would exchange the suffering that I endured here on earth for my salvation every single time. Yeah. Well, you know, we have to remember those of us of European descent, a third of Europe died at the black plague. Right. And most people think that came from the East. It came from Asia. We're not sitting around talking about how darn evil those Asians are. It's a disease, folks. Yeah. It's a disease. Disease are not personal agents. You know, we don't blame Asians because they first had the bug and then we got. It's just like if I know my neighbor has the flu and then the next week I get the flu because I was, you know, maybe had dinner at their house. I don't get all ticked off at the neighbor. It's not his fault right. that I contracted his flu. It stinks. You know, we should do our best not to. But I mean, that's, I mean, what are you going to do? String them and, up. And they don't know. They don't know. If a Spaniard walks on the beaches of Cuba, he doesn't know anything about this. If he sneezes right. next to a, a native. Right. So and, this whole and, idea of demonizing people over, over illnesses that travel from one person to another. You know, unless it's something like AIDS, where we know exactly how it is intentionally passed from one person to the other, right? We're talking about sneezes and coughs and shaking of hands and hugs and whatever. You know? Yeah. What are you gonna something, do? Something else that we that we absolutely cannot overlook is the socialistic element of what's taking place mm -hmm. in the city as well, because at the same time that they're pushing for this. Uh, syncretistic right of paganism and Christianity. Uh, they're also pushing for women's ordination. They're pushing for married priests. So these are all the theological problems. But there is also a socialist element to this. Uh, one of the very first things that took place in the Vatican Gardens was that these people brought forward to Pope Francis the statue of the Pachamama, calling it Our Lady of the Amazon, which she most certainly is not, uh, and they also gave him a black tukum ring. Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay, so the black tukum ring represents the fight of liberation theology in South America. It is, it's a ring of unity. It's like they're saying that we are all unified in this fight together. Uh, so this black tukum ring is brought forward uh, in the Amazon Synod. And you can see 
all these people who are participating in in um, the synod wearing these black rings, even some bishops. I saw a couple of bishops wearing the black ring as well. I think it was uh, Humus who was wearing one. Really? Uh, I, I thought the cardinal. I, I thought I saw one on his ring or on his hand. And it was it was only in one of those videos. We need to verify that. Everybody look. Yeah. Let us know in the comments. But I'm pretty sure I saw it on his hand while he was uh, do, doing that dance in 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 the uh, <laughs> you know with the shaking the rain stick yeah. and all that. Yeah, I think it was in that video. One of them was wearing a tukum ring. I'm pretty sure. Mm. Um, but here's the thing. At the very at, back in July, you had and, and I can't remember his name. He's he's kind of the the grandfather of of liberation theology down there in South America. A uh, big figure. He's also, I believe he's in Rome right now. Um, but he gave a talk about the importance of liberation theology at the Amazon Synod. And he said, we can't use the phrase liberation theology because it's too scary to Western folks. <laughs> so we have to talk about integral ecology. Yep. And we have to, you know, he, he gave several other words. We have to talk about the environment. We have to talk about uh, the indigenous peoples and the rights of these peoples. And so he gave all these other talking points, which equated with liberation theology, but it all goes back to the socialism. And, and it, this also falls in with uh, Sh- Shiako Shikuru, because what he was doing uh he would give speeches and and conduct these agitation rallies with the PSB. And the PSB is the local socialist party of Brazil. Mm-hmm. In fact, you can see him giving one of his speeches and right next to him is a guy wearing a red PSB hat. And it is the, the hat, the symbol of the local socialist party. This is all socialism. It is a socialist rebellion pushing heresy at the synod. It's, <laughs> And, and, you know, again, my wife and I talking last night, one of the things that we discussed was just how different this is from anything else that the church has ever endured. Mm. We talked about the Albigensian heresy that erupted in France that was so horrible that the Pope himself called a crusade against it. Yep. Uh, but it was – and. and what was happening with the Albigensians, they were saying, well, we ought to engage in whatever kind of vices we want to because uh, the flesh is evil and, and only the spirit is good. And so we have to just go ahead and let your, you know, whatever you want to do, just just go ahead and do it. There's no real sin in it. Uh, it's not going to stain your soul, as, as, as it were. And it was such a pernicious heresy uh, that the Pope called a crusade. It was a local heresy. And it does, in a sense, represent what we're fighting today, but never, never in the history of the church has such a pernicious error come from the top down. And that's where we are. This is the elevation and the the spread of error from the very top. And I, I'm a little dubious on um, Our Lady of La Salette, but she did say that Rome would lose the faith. And Rome that, will lose the faith. Rome will go into eclipse. That's the language that I just keep keep repeating to myself because an eclipse is temporary, which gives right. me hope. Exactly. Exactly, yes. And it's also, you know, it relates to the miracle of the sun. It relates to, to everything going on with this cosmic worship and the worship of earth and all that, that even the church herself will be eclipsed covered over and then revealed again. So that comes from our lady of La Salette folks. So yeah, it's scary. And these connections with socialism, you know, we have to understand St. Augustine early on said that if there is no God and there is no afterlife, he says this in city of God, St. Augustine, Mm -hmm. the moral duty of every man would be to equally share the goods of the earth. Right. In other words, St. Augustine, 400s, early 400s, realize that if you deny God, you deny the beatific vision, you deny the afterlife, the only good, the only happiness is in this life. And therefore, there's a moral imperative that we make all the goods of this life, all the food, all the land, all the money, we should spread it all equally. So in other words, the natural consequence of atheism is communism. 
Augustine didn't have the vocab. Right. Yes, but it's interesting that Marx reaches the same conclusion. If yep. you're an atheist, if religion is just an opiate, right, you get rid of all that. And what the the moral imperative for humanity is to equally divide all natural goods. Right. Because now, and, and what you end up worshiping is natural goods. In other words, mm -hmm. nature. Right. So the idea of the worship of the earth and the equal distribution of the goods of the earth, right? Like right. if earth is your mom, if you got a mom, I, I, my wife has eight kids. You better believe she divides everything equally among them. She's very just, right? She's a social justice warrior when it comes to the kids, right? Sure. At Christmas, she's like, I don't know. Like we kind of got a little extra for her. Maybe we should get a little extra for him, right? At Christmas. So that's the same idea here. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is that in, in so doing, she, there's a proportionality too, right? She's not going to give an Encyclopedia Britannica to your youngest child, <laughs> right. but she might for your college age child mm -hmm. because it's something. And That's so I'm not, 1990s hitch porn. I know, I know, I know. An it Encyclopedia was, Britannica. It was the first thing that popped into my head. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you're not going to get a um, Latin a, version of the Summa. Right. Yes. There we go. There we go. Um, or, or even like a, a tool set. You're not going to give a tool set to your daughter. Um, I mean, not to say that women can't use tools, but your daughter, like a five year old is, daughter, the five year old daughter. Yeah. yeah you're not going to give her a socket set. Um, <laughs> yeah. My five year old, six year old daughter would be ticked if she got a socket set. Right. Even though the socket set might be worth more than the $5 doll that your wife would give her instead. So the proportionality uh, in, in distributing the goods also plays a part in where they are in their lives. And so when God distributes graces and when Our Lady distributes graces, it's always in proportion to where we are and who we are. And it's not this portion here, portion here, portion here, portion here. If you're sitting at a table and you're trying to figure out how, you know, you've got a limited amount of food and you want to feed everybody at the table— you're not going to give the five-year-old an adult portion, and you're not going to give the head of the table a five-year-old's portion. There is a proportionality. There is there's a, a ratio to be had in the distribution of goods. So in the socialist sense, where they want to say every portion is equal and it's all distributed equally, is itself disproportionate. Yeah. Yeah. And it completely removes the idea of of merit, of work, of worth, all these things that are part of human society. Yeah. So, okay, I want to go back to um, Chikao. So okay. he was killed. He was, what, what are the circumstances in which he was killed? He was gunned down. Um, I It was written in Portuguese, and I couldn't find an English mm -hmm. translation of what happened. Okay. Um, all I know is that he was gunned down. And I saw a picture of a car that was kind of you know, crashed. And so I'm assuming that they shot him while he was driving. I see. Um, but, yeah. uh, the, the speculation is that he was killed by local landowners because of the disputes that they were having. Um, and, and what people need to understand is that the indigenous peoples that he was leading were squatting on the lands and they were actually damaging, Right. Uh, some of the crops and some of the resources that the landowners and they, they rightly owned that land and they were rightly using the resources. Uh, it became kind of a land war, a land dispute. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not justifying murder, but no. if, if we're to put it in its proper context, this wasn't just some guy who was giving speeches who got shot. Right. It's a political movement. Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. A political movement with direct consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. mentioned Karl Marx's opiate of the masses, and a lot of people say that that was Karl Marx giving a flippant response to uh, the nature of, of religion, that it's just the opiate of the masses. It, it really has nothing to do with anything. It just causes hallucinations. But he was also talking about it in terms of its practical use, because religion, if it is an opiate, subdues. And so what's happening here with the synod, with the promotion of syncretism and everything else, it's all a vehicle of subduing the masses, introducing socialist ideas 
through religion. So religion is being used as a vehicle for promoting socialism. Mm -hmm. I was amazed when I was looking this stu stuff up yesterday that Pachamama, Mama Pacha, all there are now uh, tourist pilgrimages that Westerners are taking, New Age people are taking, yes. And they go to the sites and you get to meet a shaman. Yeah, Google this, folks. You can go. It's like you want to go to Lourdes, Fatima, or we can go Pachamama trip. And and these Westerners are coming over. They get gifts. They get totems. Yeah, it's all included. Wow. That's how you get and, possessed, people. You want demons. Yeah. That's how you get demons. That's right. <laughs> you know, um, and, and these things, they are cursed objects. You know, yeah. you, you can't accept them. You can't bring them into your house. You can't... Uh, mm -mm. And put them on your shelves. Yeah. Don't. Do it. Yeah. The, the, so I was also the Pachamama. She's the earth goddess. Pacha, Paca means something like, it's almost like Seculum in Latin. It means age or world. Like mm. We have a hard time translating that in English. So we say like world without end, but it's the same kind of idea. And she is the earth. So when the earthquakes rumble, that's her upset. Right. Yeah, uh, it's it's very much the same idea in the Polynesian religions. I'm sure people have seen the Moana Disney film, right? This this goddess, right, who's asleep under the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and so everything that good that comes out of the earth, your food, your clothing, your I guess in a way your children uh, comes from her. And then the evils that you experience also come from her. Right. Everywhere she is worshipped, anthropologists have found child sacrifice. Yep. Everywhere. 10 years ago, they used to deny it. Mm -hmm. Oh, these were just sick children. No, now they know they found massive burial sites of right. child sacrifice. Um, allegedly, I don't know if they're, I guess they're offered to her, Pachamama. Right. So this well, is and, an and, evil religion. And so what are we finding in the Amazon too? Mm -hmm. uh, Church Militant put out a couple of articles recently showing, I mean, actually showing video of these rituals where they would bury children alive. Yes. Uh, infanticide is very real in that region, especially among the Indians. Uh, cannibalism is still practiced mm -hmm. in, in secret uh, in many ways because it's illegal, but it is still practiced. Yeah. And this, if you look at European and, and uh, North American ecology and paganism, they also want to go back to the New Age, Wicca, worship of Mother Earth, and they're all about abortion. And abortion is promoted because it helps not pollute the Earth. Right. It goes hand in hand. So whether paganism is old, whether paganism is new, it's the same thing. It's anti-Christ. Yeah, it's anti-Christ. It's, uh, I don't know what else to say about it other than it's, it's an abomination and it is being spread at the top. The Pope is allowing it. He's promoting it. Yeah. He's this is just it. some, yeah, it's not just some passive thing. Yeah. People He's said that he got mad when they did it in the garden. Oh, I know. That's not how I look mad in the garden. Mm -mm. No, not <laughs> only that, but if he abandoned his prepared remarks, which we have no idea what they were, incidentally, right. we have no idea what his prepared remarks were, but if if let's just say for the sake of argument that he really was taken off guard and that uh, he didn't know that that's what they were going to do, um, he could very well have said, I don't want those people part processing the gifts up on Sunday mass two right. days later, but he did. Or bringing that, that same idol into St. Peter's. Precisely. Uh, and he chastised those who actually had harsh things to say about what they did. So if he was taken off guard, he not only could he have said so, but he could also have not chastised those who had a problem with the tree planting ceremony. Yeah. But he chastised those who chastised him for having the tree planting ceremony. Mm -hmm. So no, he wasn't taken off guard. And yes, he is supporting and promoting what they're doing. There's no two ways about it. Yeah. Can you, I mean, Hitchborn, think about this. Three weeks ago, you and I were thinking, oh my goodness, you're going to talk about women deacons and married priests. Would mm. you have thought we would be looking at a photo of the Pope standing in St. Peter's 
in front of Pachamama, a goddess of the Amazonian region? No, I, I do have to admit I was taken off guard by that. Um, I, I fully expected that we were going to be talking about socialism, which we are, and uh, women deacons, which we are. But I, I didn't expect this, uh, this syncretism that's being promoted. In fact, the working document, <clears throat> you talked about it, I mm-hmm. talked about it. We talked about how the working document actually mentioned the idea of elevating the, the local practices of shamans. Yes. Uh, and incorporating them somehow. But the response from all of the the uh, the, P- the Pope Francis defenders, the apologists, was always the same. You guys are reading too much into this. You're saying that this is going to be some sort of syncretism. They're going to promote some sort of paganism. That's not what this means. They just want to have their own local customs and and uh, their their own local culture. Uh, as they bring it into the church. We want to have enculturated Christianity. So you naysayers saying that this is about paganism, you're all wrong. No, we're not. No, we're not. Because we are now witnessing the fulfillment of everything that we said was going to happen. Yep. I pointed out in several videos that the language of mother, father, father, mother as an as a title for God was yeah. in the working document. That's right. Surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and and by the way, uh, the principal author of the working document, uh, I, I think you probably saw the video, Edward Penton uh, cornered him oh, and said, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about incorporating women and elevating them in different positions. Uh, do you support women priests? And he says, oh, of course I do. And he says, do you think that the Amazon Synod is going to be a vehicle for promoting women priests? You know, you're talking about women deacons. Do you think that this could be used to promote women priests? And he, he had a language barrier moment and he was having a hard time finding his words. But ultimately he said, well, yes, perhaps a step two. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we're talking about that. And where do you see priestesses in pagan religions? That's right. Where do you see sodomy in pagan religions? The occult. And priestesses and sodomy are interconnected. And they idols. are separable and idols. Mm-hmm. Oh, and child sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, you want to draw in the child sacrifice. How come Pope Francis keeps promoting and elevating and, and praising people who are pro abortion? Yeah. Oh, and, and, been... and protecting cardinals with reputations. Yes. Yes. So you put it all together and it's it's all deliberate. It can't not be deliberate. No. Yeah. It's not a conspiracy theory, folks. It's not a conspiracy no. theory. We will say infiltration conspiracy theory. Where are you now? Look on the screen right now and look at that idol. Tell me that's a conspiracy yeah. theory. Right. It's not. It is in your face. And you oh, know, you even have you- uh you know, he met with James Martin last mm-hmm. week. You had James oh. Martin say that Newman was alleging that Newman was a homosexual. Mm-hmm. They are so bold right now. They know yeah. they think they're well. They think they're untouchable because sure. they have Francis backing them. But who are you going to believe, Taylor? Your your uh, what they tell you or your lying eyes? Right. Exactly. So what do we do moving forward? I mean, what if? God forbid. What if this becomes stylish, where you have a Pachamama in your local parish? I can see goofball priests saying that's so cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna order myself a 9.99 Pachamama hand carved idol. I'm gonna bring it to my parish and say, "Hey, let's recycle and take care of Mother Earth." Look at this Pachamama. I'll show them a new definition of recycling. That's what I would do. Uh, oh, <laughs> boom! Getting um, deep. We yeah, have to well, resist this, guys, and and yeah. w- you can't. You cannot accept women's ordination. You cannot accept idolatry. You cannot accept sodomy. You cannot accept any of these ills. Right. Be the Maccabee. Be the Maccabee. This must be destroyed. It must be removed. Think about the Maccabees, how they fought so hard and then cleansed the temple. Amen. Think about Phineas and how zealous he was for the law. Think about Moses when he came down the mountain and he saw the people worshiping the golden calf. Mm-hmm. Threw down the Ten Commandments. Literally, he threw down. This is where we're at. Now is the time for honorable men. 
Now is the time for heroes. Now is the time for men to risk reputation, maybe risk a little jail time and do the right thing. Now yeah, is the time. You, you want to be a saint? Right. Now is the time. Well, we should also be practicing mortifications. We should be practicing and preparing for what's coming. Right. And quite honestly, what's coming is going to be an eclipse of the church. You know, I, I fully expect now to see a suppression of the traditional Latin mass. Mm -hmm. I fully expect to see some sort of compromise that's going to be forced upon the Novus Ordo Church, mm -hmm. where it's going to be incorporating deaconesses. They're mm -hmm. going to be incorporating this Pachamama pagan idol. Mm -hmm. They're going to be incorporating all these different things that are impossible and incompatible with the faith. So, the, and, and, and we have to remember, just like a hurricane or just like an eclipse, it's going to come through, it will be scary, and then it will end. Yes. It will and must come to an end. So we have to be perseverant. We have to have fortitude, and we have to have the wisdom to understand that God is not going to let this go on indefinitely. That's right. And we have to you know, offer our sacrifices, offer the pain and suffering, be prepared, but don't, don't despair. And that's, that's where a lot of people are going. They're saying, well, maybe I need to become Orthodox or maybe I need to jump ship or maybe, you know, I converted for this. Don't look at what's actually happening and say that this is the church because it's not right. If you've ever seen the movie Metropolis, uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, it's a silent film from 1926 provides, I think the best analogy for what we're going through right now. Because in the Metropolis movie, there's a woman named Maria who represents the church. She comes from the underground and goes up into the beautiful uh, Metropolis above. And she tries to reveal that there is a life down below in the, in the land below the, uh, the Metropolis. The mayor of the Metropolis suppresses that. He doesn't want her to show up. Hmm. His son falls in love with her and goes and realizes that she's preaching a beautiful message. And he wants to be a part of that message as well. So the mayor of the metropolis goes to a local mad scientist who has this robot and the robot is sitting on a throne with a pentagram behind the what? robot. Yes. And he kidnaps Maria, the woman from down below and puts her into this machine and uses her image to imprint on the robot. And then the robot goes into the metropolis looking like Maria, but speaking a very different message. And she wounds up promoting lust and promoting war and promoting division and vice and all sorts of other things. But it's not Maria. Looks like her, but it isn't. Right. It's a fantastic movie, and I think that it represents what we're going through right now. If we are going to survive, we have to recognize falsehood for falsehood. And realize that if the church is in eclipse, the eclipse is temporary. That's right. That's right. And we need to draw close to the real Maria. Amen. Ave Maria. Pray the rosary every single day. I'm going to take all this filth off the screen. I'm going to Thank put you. Our Lady on the screen to get everybody Amen. rooted back in what we're all about here. Because... Our Lady at Fatima said her immaculate heart will triumph. I don't think that's a maybe. I think it's a promise. Yeah, I agree. I think Our Lady will triumph. And her goal is to bring us to Jesus. Do whatever he tells you to do. Her soul magnifies the Lord. So that means when you look at Mary, she's a magnifying glass that helps you see Jesus bigger. Yep. And he is the king of creation. He's the king of all nations. And all the god, all the gods of the nations, like you said earlier, are devils. Yep. Psalm ninety-five, five, in the Dewey Rames. Look it up. All the gods of the Gentiles are devils, but the Lord made the heavens. So this has to die. It has to go away. It's uh, the hardest part, as you already said, Hishborn, is that Francis, the cardinals, the bishops, are in on it. Yeah. We've been infiltrated, folks. Wake up. We have been infiltrated. And the yes, church is an eclipse and most likely will go darker into an eclipse. 
Eclipses are pretty fast, but they are gradual. Yeah. And eventually it goes dark. But that'll be, for, I think, for a moment. Roberto De Mattei, when we were in Rome last week, he said every revolution happens way faster than you expected and then it's over. Like the French yeah. Revolution. He named some other ones as a historian. He said, I think that's what will happen in the church. It will ramp up very quickly. It'll burn bright and then it'll burn out. And hopefully yeah. we have the age of Mary. Let's pray for that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone, uh, please like this video. Please subscribe. Please. What's the name of your channel? Channel, Hishborn? Uh, Lepanto Institute. Lepanto Institute. Um, we're going to have you back and we're going to talk about CRS uh -huh. uh, in a couple weeks. The campaign for human development and the CRS campaign. Every year they claim, oh, we got rid of all that pro-contraceptive, pro-LMNOP, pro-that. This year it's different. Mm -hmm. And Hitchborn and the Lepanto Institute are the guys digging deep, doing the research and finding out what these people are about. And look, we lay people. We don't wear miters. We don't have croziers. We don't ordain priests. We don't say mass. We pray the rosary, but we also have wallets. We have money. And we also have our feet. So you need to vote with your wallet and vote with your feet. That's the only check. It's the only balance that we have. So do not give money to these freaky religions these freaky rites these freaky pagans zero money and i think it's good to tell priest and bishop i i would have given this much but i'm not giving anything because you're silent about the paganism you're silent about the sodomy you're silent about james martin whatever time to yeah. be a saint joseph time to be a saint joseph and protect christ and our lady so Please like this. Please go over to Lepanto. Please follow uh, what what uh, Hitchborn's doing. Consider maybe donating to Lepanto Institute. Help them out. Uh, he'd really appreciate that. I'd appreciate it because I get good info from Lepanto Institute. So thanks for all your work, uh, Hitchborn. And then also, please uh, subscribe to this channel and hit the bell. And share this video on Facebook and Twitter. There's a share button next to the subscribe button, bottom right under this video. Please do that. If you're listening on iTunes, please leave a review. Love to read those as well. And we'll close in our prayer. We're going to ask Our Lady to help us. We'll pray the Ave Maria, the Hail Mary, asking Our Lady to protect us. And then, Hitchborn, let's pray the Gloria, Gloria Patri, the Glory Be, thanking God that he's got a plan to get us out. Roger that. Let's do it. All right. Here, I'm going to put it on the screen. In nomine Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in morieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta San Maria, Mater Dei, or pronobis peccatoribus, nunca de tor mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Sancto, sicuterat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. St. Peter. Pray for us. St. Paul. Pray for us. St. John the Baptist. Pray for us. St. Leo. Pray for us. St. Gregory the Great. Pray for us. St. Pius V. Pray for us. St. Pius X. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody, go check out Michael Hitchborn, Lepanto Institute. Pray the rosary every single day, at least five decades. If you're not praying the rosary, you're not on the team. Till next time, God bless. Bye. God bless.